Welcome to this episode of the Manny Matt Sackis Show, and I um, have a special guest today, and uh, someone I'm fortunate enough to have coached with for three years, and uh, we go back a long ways, and we've kept in touch over the years. I think for everybody here, um, the opportunity to meet Greg Gigantino uh, as a coach, as administrator, anybody out there, I think what you will find out exactly what I feel about this guy is he is without a doubt one of the top defensive coaches, recruiters that I've seen in my whole career. I mean, and it, you can see because the proof is in the pudding. And uh, Greg, uh, welcome. How are you doing? Doing great, Manny. It's always great to see you every time we get a chance to get together. Yeah, I'll tell you, it, it's funny as we go through this, and um, what I'd like to do is, is give our audience a really good opportunity to get to know your background. And so uh, just give me, like, where you grew up and, and how you – just take me through till you decided, hey, I'm, I'm going to be a college football coach or I'm going to get into yeah. coaching. Yeah, well, I grew up in Edison, New Jersey, and uh, – you know, played football there and all that. And J.P. Stevens High School. Then I went to Wagner College, played football there. And my brother, who's four years older than me, he kind of did the same thing. And he went to Bridgeport. And then he he got a GA job in 1972 at uh, Bridgeport. He was going to graduate and then go there. Well, th during that summer, he met a guy named Mike White, who was the head coach at Cal. So just Mike White took a liking to my brother. He he got him out at Cal. So he was he was a GA out of Cal. And that following summer, my brother got me into this camp. And I started working with, I was like a counselor, but I used to help the coaches. And I met all these college coaches. And I was like, wow, these guys are great. And uh, that's kind of when I wanted to, I started saying, you know what? I think I want to be a college coach. So I would be the counselor in the dorm. All, you know, every night and when the kids were there. And then when the, we were on the field, I'd go hang around with these college coaches and learn how to coach. And it used to be like three weeks each summer. So I would stay with, you know, a guy from Notre Dame for a week. I'd stay with a guy from yeah. Michigan for a week. This is back in the day where there weren't all these millions of camps. And we had 65 or 70 college coaches there. It was great. So that's kind of when I decided, you know what, this is what I want to do. Hmm. So what was your first actual coaching job in college? Well, I, in 1977, I was a graduate assistant at Indiana, Pennsylvania. Oh, wow. Okay. And on the, I'm a junior on the team, Jim Hazlitt. Oh, wow. Senior on the team, Tony Marciano. So, you know, there were some guys there that ended up in the NFL. And was I coached for a great guy named Bill Neal. He was just a fantastic man and... I did that for one year, and then I got a GA job at Rutgers. Oh, okay. So, and and who was the head coach at Rutgers you work with? Uh, Frank Burns. Yeah, you know, legendary. Legendary Frank Burns, who passed away recently, but yeah, I was there for six years with Frank, and I was uh, like a GA, and two years like a part-time guy, and then three years as the defensive line coach full time. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Now, Rutgers back then was uh, what? What league were they in? How were they set up? We were like a lot. All the other teams in the East, we were an independent. When no one was in a league, uh, we played people from Delaware and Columbia and William and Mary up to Penn State. So we were playing wow. all kinds of different people, and I always, I always felt that. Uh, Joe Paterno wanted to start an East Coast conference way back in the 80s. And I don't know why all the schools didn't do it, but, you know, we could have had the East Coast football conference mm -hmm. or whatever, what it might have been back then. But I think everybody in the East was like, why would we want to get in a conference with Penn State? Because uh -huh. they're winning, they're beating everybody anyway. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I don't know why they didn't do it, but yeah. it was interesting. So you leave Rutgers. Left Rutgers. Went to Iona College for one year as the head coach, which was kind of the situation you were in. Yeah. I got there in, like, July. Oh, you know, there were 48 kids on the team. You know, I had to try to scramble and get 10 more kids at least to make a team. And uh, so we went through that season. And then I got well, a good friend of mine, Bob Guarini, was down at Davidson. And uh, he calls me and says, you know, we're looking for a D-line coach. So I went down and interviewed. I ended up getting a D-line, and I left and went to the 
Davidson for five years. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's pretty country down there. Oh, beautiful! Yeah. Wow. Knocking, knocking, knocking on my head. I wish I would have bought some more property down on that lake. <laughs> yeah, that's nice, no doubt. Yeah. yeah. So you leave Davidson, and then what was next? Then I went to Lehigh for one year. Yeah. And uh, it was that was you know nice experience. You know Lehigh does you know it's a great school. And then I got the call from Joe Gardy. <laughs> The legend. The legend. <laughs> yeah. Which was ironic because when I was at Davidson, I got to know Joe. I got to know Joe a little bit when I was at Rutgers. I used to go out to their training camp at Hofstra. But when Joe's son, David, was in high school, we were recruiting him. And he got his knee blown out in a yeah. scrimmage. So he kind of missed his whole senior year. So nobody recruited him. Well, he went to Choate. Uh, prep school mm-hmm. so I start I started recruiting David you know from the prep school and we made him a nice offer and coach Gardy was like yeah this is perfect but then Brown came and you know he got into Brown so he David went mm-hmm. to Brown yeah what's but, he, what's David doing now yeah he's like he's like third or fourth in charge of the NFL <laughs> he's a uh, big wig in the NFL wow. yeah. yeah he's doing great talk to him all the time mm-hmm. and then so Coach Gardy hired me in 90, and a lot of it was because I helped David out, you know? Right. You know how the Just personal relationships. reactions, yeah. relationships. Uh, well, you know you know from there, yeah. really. Cause yeah, pretty much. That's where we met a year later. A year later, yeah. Yeah, because uh, I had been coaching at Kansas State. Right. I think a crazy story on this was that um, I was studying the run-and-shoot offense and working on a – like a dissertation of some sort at Kansas State. And uh, and uh, a buddy of mine, uh, you remember Ben Griffith? Yeah, sure. Yeah. And B- ben started uh, what is now, you know, years became the ham bone at Georgia Southern. Right. He was a run and shoot guy and a triple option guy. And uh, we were best of friends. And um, and we're in the office at Kansas State at the time coaching the receivers. And, uh, and I'm like, you know, I really would like to – to run this run and shoot offense. Right. I had never done it, but I'd studied it. Ben taught it to me and I, sure. you know, so we're doing all this stuff. And uh, so as crazy as it sounds, um, there's a job that opens up at uh, Holy Cross. Okay. For right. receiver coach. And I'm like, and I go down the hall and there's John Latina, our offensive line coach and uh, who had coached and uh, knew Clyde Christensen, who was the OC at Holy Cross at the time. Sure. For Duffner. Yeah. And they were killing it. I mean, you know, they had scholarships. Mm-hmm. Nobody else did. They were, you know, they were doing a great job. But, you know, deservedly so. They, they, they went on to Maryland after they had won. But the funny thing was, it's like Clyde's calling me and he says, hey, look, if John Latina says you're the guy, I'm going to try to get you the job. So I said, well, that's fantastic. Just give me an interview. It's all I need. You know, right. and it'll be, I was ready to go. And, uh, and then Clyde calls back a day or two later. Hey, we had this guy in from Hofstra. It was Rob Spence. Right, right. And uh, he goes, and, and uh, we just, I, I think uh, Duff wants to just hire him and we don't even want to interview anybody else. Get over it. Yep. Yeah. And I said, oh, darn. I said, what, well, what's a Hofstra? You know, <laughs> I hadn't known. You know, I, I, Hofstra to me was, I think, in a Bill Cosby uh, comic. It was. You know, like a skit or right. something, you know. And uh, he, he goes, uh, well, yeah, it's a good program. I think they're, they're going from Division Three to 1AA. Like, I go, really? Well, that's the same level as you guys. And he goes, yeah, yeah. I said, I'm thinking to myself, why would you leave an OC job to go be a receiver coach at what you're going to be anyway? Right. It didn't make sense. And I'm like, well, great. So I go down the hall, and I I told Ben, and I said, look, i got to get in with this Joe Gardy. He's the head coach. Mm -hmm. I said, I don't know how I'm going to do this. And uh, and all of a sudden, he goes, well, let's call Mouse. Right. I said, okay. So I didn't know Mouse Davis. Ben was tight with him. And uh, and he puts me on the phone with Mouse, and Mouse makes a call to Joe. I think they coached against each other in the yeah. World Football League or That's something right. like they that. That's right, they did. Yep. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, uh, Joe, you know, I, I, he, Mouse says, calls back and says, hey, call Joe Gardy. Here's his, here's his number. Mm-hmm. It wasn't like cell phones back then. And, <laughs> and I think Joe had known who he was going to hire. He wanted well. We were we were kind of I don't know if you want to call it run and shoot, but yeah. we were no tight end, yeah. one back, four receiver offense. That's what he wanted to stay mm-hmm. with. Yeah, that's what he wanted, and and he may have had a guy at the time that before 
I had gotten on the phone with him because I, I sensed some hesitancy. Mm-hmm. And when I'm at Kansas State, he's looking, why you want to leave Kansas State to come to Hofstra right, right now? And, and I said, hey, Coach Gardy, it's real simple. I just want a chance to interview with you. And I told him, I said, look, if I will fly myself out there, it was like in two days, I'll get a ticket tomorrow. Right. And if you hire me, just reimburse me for the ticket. If you don't, you didn't lose anything. It's on me. And, and that, that's all Joe needed to hear. It's like, sure. well, I got nothing to lose. And I think <laughs> he just enjoyed interviewing guys. Hey, I think it was, he, all over the years, he just put guys on the board. And uh, so I fly out there. Like, well, I think we're, I had this eight-hour-long presentation. I think we cut it off at about two hours. And, and he takes me to his office and offers me the I'm job. Sure. You know, And it was like, I'm moving to New York. So I go from Manhattan, Kansas, to <laughs> the Little Apple, to, <laughs> to what the was Big the Apple. Big, yeah. That's funny. So, so that's how we got to know each other because yeah. you were the defensive coordinator at the time. And it, w- it was interesting to me because our defense was lights out. I mean, you guys, I mean, this is no joke. Yeah. It was like we had a great offense because our defense was outstanding, like even better. I mean, you had some dudes you'd recruited. I mean, sure. I Jeff mean, Brown and Hervé Damas and oh my. guy after guy. And oh, yeah. they were great players. They were great, great guys that coach. And, um, you know, Joe basically just left us alone. I mean, he, you ran the defense, we ran the offense, and it was just, right. uh, you know, just. You know, the, what do you just say? Don't tell me how rocky the seas are. Yeah, just bring in the ship. <laughs> that was Joe. And, and it was like, okay, this is different than Bill Snyder. For me, it was just a different way of doing it. Right. And he was not a meddler. He would let you do your thing. I mean, he'd ask you if something went wrong. He'd say, well, you know, what's the story? Yeah. But that was the great thing about Coach Gardy. He'd just let you coach. And the other thing, Manny, that's he, he, you ran the offense, I ran the defense, and he did all the special teams. Oh, loved it. He loved the special yeah. teams because that's what he went to the Jets as. Yeah. As um, Lou Holtz's special teams coach. That's right. For one year. And that's what, uh, you know, he did that for a couple of years. Then he became the coordinator of Jets. Yeah. Now, you know, it's interesting. It's talk about Joe for a little bit. It's like, you know, he passed away nine years ago, wow. like five days ago. Jeez. Mm-hmm. Okay, nine years ago in June, and uh, he, uh, you know, he had been the defensive coordinator for the New York Jets when they had the sack exchange yes. defense. So I was like Klecko, Gastineau, mm-hmm. Marty Lyons, yeah. Greg Buttle. Jeez, tremendous, uh, right? unbelievable, yeah, unbelievable. And the nice thing about that, those guys would always they were they would come back. They'd come to Hofstra. Mm-hmm. We always Marty every year had us play in his tournament. Yeah. Greg Buttle. He, he had a big restaurant. He gave us a card. We could go down there, anything you wanted, half price. Yeah, it was all great stuff, you know. Those yeah. guys really like Coach Gardy. They really, yeah. I mean, and, and Joe was fantastic in so many ways. And it's like he had a storied career. I think he had gotten out of the – after it was over in the NFL, for him as a coach, he got into the officiating. Correct. The National Football League. That's when they started replay. He was one of the replay guys back in those days they had a guy at every game mm-hmm. and he when there was a replay problem they would put the camera on him and say this is Joe Gardy you making a decision here oh you know so it was yeah. kind of a little pressure on you but now how did he land the job at Hofstra because he had been out of coaching for a little while I think he was out for five years and uh, I think just through the connections with the Jets you know, a lot of people knew, a lot of the Hofstra people knew the Jet people and, you know, Joe Margiata oh, yeah. and George Dempster. Mm-hmm. Those guys knew all those Jet people and they, they knew Joe's name, obviously. And he had a, he had a good reputation. And uh, I think uh, that's kind of how he, he landed that thing. Mm-hmm. Jim Short, yeah, the president, the president. Yeah. was the was the big the big one. Now he had played football at Hofstra, right? Jim, yeah. Well, that was the greatest thing about Hofstra <laughs> ever. The head of the booster club, yeah. who was a big lawyer, mm-hmm. the president, and the athletic director all played football at Hofstra. Yeah. So yeah, I had never. I, I'm not sure. Doesn't that, get any better no, than that. It really doesn't because they got what it took. They understood that football was a vehicle for public relations yep. for the university. And it, 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 not that it put it on the map, but it, it just everybody pays attention to that in right. the fall. And it's a renewal every year. And Hofstra, 
was vibrant at that point in time. Right, and I remember Jim Short saying, like the year before you got there, we got to the semifinals of the Division Three. That's right. Well, the New York Times did a whole half-page sports article mm-hmm. about our team and how great we were. We were twelve and zero, and and Jim Short said to us, he says, "That's worth that's worth a hundred thousand dollar ad." Yeah. To have oh, that yeah, in the New, New, New York Times or, you know, and, yeah. you know, the New York media. They, anytime they mention your name, that's worth money. Yeah. So. And it really did. And, and the campus is beautiful. And then, beautiful. And then as you guys were there, I think after three years I left and I went back to Kansas State. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I would always watch and see how you guys were doing. Right. And, and you re- I mean, we had established it as a 1AA program. Then you guys just took it to a whole different level. Well. Right, and it's those all those guys we recruited, like when you were there, yeah. those couple of years where we were in that transition, mm-hmm. Wayne Corbett and those guys, yeah. they yeah. all became juniors, and Hervé, and yeah. they were all like juniors and seniors, you know, after you had left, yeah. so we were... We were beating all these one double A teams. Yeah, without the scholarships they right. had. Right, Because I can remember, uh, when I was there, we, there's, a, there's a couple games that stuck out, but one particular one... We're playing against the University of Maine right. up in November. Oh, up in the mud yeah. bowl? The oh, mud bowl? it was mud, snow, sleet, <laughs> the whole thing, all four quarters. It was like goes from Indian yep. summer. Yep. And yep. it, was a, it was a crazy day. And we're like, we're, some, we're, we're getting after them. I mean, both sides of the ball. I mean, right. they can't move the ball. We're scoring. And I think it started snowing. And um, – <laughs> Who was oh I think it was Raphael Morales. Yeah. I remember a little, yeah, a little slot receiver from Puerto from Rico. From Puerto Rico, yeah. yeah. He he catches a choice route for a touchdown, just smokes him and uh and he comes back and uh you know and it's snowing at that point and he like I think he's like slid into and like having into, fun, like like right, kid, right, do right. that. And Joe looks at me, he goes, he goes, get that under control. He goes, we're trying to get in this league. And if we can't, if we run the score up on these right. guys, they're not going to let us in their league, uh, which was the Yankee conference. Yes. And Joe was always worried about, because we were independent. Right. And the Patriot League wouldn't let us come in. Nope. And then they were trying to get into the Yankee conference at the time, right. which was those schools like Delaware, Maine, and New Hampshire. Which have, like. Yeah, they changed it to the Atlantic 10 at one mm-hmm. point. Now they're the yeah. AAC or CC. I don't know what they mm-hmm. are. Whatever they are. Yeah, I mean, so it, it was fun, you know, because we were, and I, I think it got to the point where Hofstra had built a powerhouse of, of, on the East Coast. Unbelievable. And and you look at some of the great, one, great coaches that have come through that. I mean, we, we talk about Rob Spence, who's a fantastic football right. coach himself. Um, give me a few guys, because you were there longer with Joe than any other assistant right. coach. Right, right. Who are some other guys that have well, come through as coaches? It's, it's funny you mention that because... You know, like after you left, we had uh, Mike McCarty came in and ran basically the same thing you were running. And then we have some young assistants, Dave Brock, who's now with the Atlanta Falcons. Mm -hmm. He was an assistant on that staff. Dan Quinn was on our defensive staff. He was our D-line coach. He's the head coach of the Atlanta Falcons. Raheem Morris was playing for us. He's the assistant head coach of the Falcons and was the head coach at Tampa Bay. Uh, Kyle Flood was our old line coach. He was the head coach at Rutgers, and he's at Alabama right now. Mm-hmm. Sarah Gigantino, my daughter, is the assistant to uh, Dan Quinn at the Atlanta Falcons. So we've had some great, great coaches come through there, and, yeah. and there's many, many more. Oh, you know, yeah. Bobby Max, the head, he's the D.C. at Stony Brook now, and, well, you know, just good, good guys came through oh, there. Yeah. And it's funny, in, in the offshoots of some of this stuff, it's like what you don't realize in, in the coaching profession, you get a guy like uh, Vinny Sinagra. Right. right. Vinny uh, came in that one year, and he had never coached receivers. I said, I just coach, I'll show you. Let's just do this. Right. He did a great job. He was a defensive guy that Joe yes. knew. Yes. You know, because Joe liked to hire. If he get an Italian coach, he's <laughs> Italian. I get it. So uh, we connected. And then later on, he goes and worked for a buddy of mine at Fordham, Nick Quartero. Nick Quartero, yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, and now it's it's crazy because he goes there. The connections he makes um, was it uh, the head coach at Temple, uh, Collins. Collins, right? right, Jeff, yeah. And you know, he I see him down in Philadelphia. He's working at Temple for mm-hmm. him, and now he's at Georgia Tech. Yeah, he's at you Georgia know? Tech, and it's like it's yeah, it snowballs, you know. It really does, and it's and, it's something. And that's the interesting thing about coaching is the 
people you meet and mm -hmm. along the way. Oh, it is. And it's, it's fantastic. Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. It is. And, and, you know, so when I think about Hofstra and I think about, you know, we talk about all these great coaches that have come through there. And these guys could develop talent, and they could they could flat out coach. Mm -hmm. And obviously, these guys you're talking about are at the highest levels. Right. And but these players, I <laughs> mean, we were able to we you you more than anybody else because I, I think over time, without question, the top recruiter there. And when you look at the guys that were coming through in Hempstead, New York, that ended up being outstanding players in the brief, in the three years I was there, you know, you get a guy like Dave Fiore, unbelievable, you know, Domingo, Wayne, Wayne Corbett, Domingo Graham. Um, and that's just Raheem. Yeah, was we, he there? And was yeah, Lance, Lance came a year after, after Schulters. Yeah. Right. Uh, and Oh yeah. Wayne Corbett. He wasn't bad either. No, he right. wasn't too yeah. bad. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, and, and there's so many, I mean, you know, we were talking about the NFL players, they came out of a school like that. Those initial guys I just talked about, they didn't even come with scholarships. Nope. We were need-based. Need-based. Yeah. Well, the year before you got there, we, you know, we were trying to – we didn't know anybody. And then we, we got this kid transferred in from Delaware, started outside. Line. He gets drafted by the Seahawks. That's yeah. when they had 12 rounds of the draft. And then – you know, then Wayne came, then Fiore, then Domingo. That was a whole group of guys we had all together oh, yeah. that were outstanding. How about, outstanding. How, how about, here's a guy, as you're saying this, Owen Gardner. Owen Gardner. Now, that's wow. that should be on 30 for 30, ESPN. What His a story. story. Because you signed him, and then you had the little, uh, the Ant Man. The right? Ant. <laughs> yeah. Nola, Nola Carter. Yeah. And, and you had brought these guys up from uh, Fort Lauderdale. From St. Thomas Aquinas, my good mm -hmm. friend George Smith. Yeah. He says, he showed, you know, back in those days, there was not a lot of, eight. there was 16 millimeter film, mm -hmm. or maybe we were just starting videotapes then. And, uh, you know, he says, well, I got this guard or center. He goes, very athletic kid, blah, blah. And he goes, but he's got one problem. I said, what do you mean? He goes, he's got a withered arm. Yeah. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, as a child, he went through a sliding glass door and severed his vein and, and arteries and nerves and his arm. His arm never developed. So I was like, oh, I don't know. But anyway, this guy was so athletic. Owen Gardner. He came in. You know this. He yeah. started every game for four years. Yeah, center for me when I was there the right. whole time. Yeah. He was the only guy you could he could snap and pull like do anything you on it. I think, and I could be off, but I mean, I don't. He was about maybe six two, six three, six and, two. Yeah, and probably about two fifty, seventy, sixty at his yeah, top. Yeah, he got bigger, right? Yeah. And, and I, I am almost certain because we used to be the ones you and I and Joe would like do the forties, <laughs> right? And he was in the four seven. Yeah, and maybe he ran four seven. He ran really good. Yeah, but if you think, Manny, that line. Oh. We had we had Owen at center. Yeah. Then you had we had Domingo at guard mm -hmm. and Fiore at tackle, who both played in the NFL. Yeah, I for mean, a long time. for a long time. Yeah. And then I don't know who else was on those other spots, but I mean that was a heck of a line. And those three, I think, all started for four years. Yes, they did. So yeah, because yeah, other was guys unique. like Steve Chamello was in there Steve, early. Yep, you know, and then they would graduate through and. Uh, you know, Fr Frank Lamani was the first O line coach I had worked with. Them. Right. I was just going to say, I just saw Frank at the Hofstra Reunion. Did you? Yeah, yeah. I haven't seen him in years. Yeah. But, know. you know, continuing with that theme there of these NFL guys, I left Hofstra in 98 and went to Cornell for three years. That's right. When I came back, you know, we, again, you know, we were, we had a tough year of my f second or third year back. But our first year back, we won the, won the league. Mm -hmm. We were in the A-10 at the time, yeah. which was the old Yankee Conference. Well, we, you know, we recruited a young kid named Marcus Colston, <laughs> who yeah. you might have heard of. Not bad, yeah. Stephen Bowen, mm -hmm. Willie Colon, um, Renault Williams was there at the time. Um, Kyle Arrington came a couple of years later. Uh, but these guys all played in the NFL mm -hmm. for years. Willie played for eight or nine years with the Steelers as a Super Bowl ring. Uh, Marcus played for the Saints, 
you know, everybody knows Marcus Colston. You know, his, him and uh, him and Drew Brees. I don't know if you know this. Him and Brees are the fifth all-time quarterback receiver touchdown combination in the NFL history. Wow, How about that? history of the NFL. That's Jeez. amazing. Yeah, amazing. And then, you know, Bowen, Stephen Bowen played. Oh, I don't know, ten years in the league. We didn't even mention Lance Schulters, who was an all-pro player, mm-hmm. got drafted by the Niners. Gio Carmazzi, back in the day, you know, of course, that didn't work out great for him. But, you know, he got drafted in the, I don't know, third round. And it was early, by the Niners. By the Niners, yeah. yeah. And, but all those guys. And then up until Hofstra dropped football probably 12 years ago, maybe, yeah, about 12 years ago, we had a kid still in the NFL. Kyle Arrington was still playing for the Ravers, Ravens two years ago. Wow. So it, it was a long, mm-hmm. long time those guys all played. And, yeah, they were they were great players. Yeah, great players, good coach, fantastic coaches, a, nope. a head coach that would let guys coach and did it right. Um, and, and in the end, it got crazy. Ugh. Well, I, I always say, I don't know for sure, but I think three things happened. Okay. President Short retired. Mm-hmm. Joe Margiotta, who we spoke about before, the head of the Booster Club and the big lawyer, he passed away, and the Jets moved off campus. So those three things happened within a two-year span, and then they dropped football. Yeah. It all happened. So fast. they got a new president. Gone, yeah, right? I was gone. Yeah, you had left, and uh, and then they hired. Uh, who was the head coach after Joe? Cohen. Cohen. A guy named Dave Cohen. Dave Cohen. So okay. Coach Gardy yeah, retired, right. and then the AD and this this guy had relationships from sure. before, so he brought him in, and we were all gone. Yeah. And then, uh, in fact, I was up at Bryant. We played them. Yeah. We we, we played Hofstra, up at up at Bryant, and then they dropped football. Yeah, remarkable. I mean, I remember hearing about this, and I'm like, how can this even be? It, it just came out of left field, and it was, uh, from what I gather, talking to some people that were there at the time, it actually all went down. It was, uh, it just came, like, out of left field. They, sure. they were shocked. Next thing you know, they've got uh, colleges on campus trying to get their players because they had they got releases, and uh, they all had a blanket release. Yeah. I was recruiting in Long Island the day it happened. Really? That afternoon, I was over at the uh, complex. And Kamal Roy, who was one of our great receivers, mm-hmm. um, he was coaching their receivers at the time. So, you know, he took care of me. I got to talk to a lot of the players. And, you know, it was, it was heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking. It is, because you think about it, all that time at Hofstra – you know, they built basically a juggernaut. Mm-hmm. And and then went during that time, you're looking at it, and it's like Stony Brook was like Division Three at the mm. beginning. They start to take off. Because right. I think uh, Jimmy Fiore was the AD right. over there. Yep. Who played guy, for us. Yep. Right? And, and you look at it, and you think, oh, my goodness. It's like all of a sudden, if somebody was in a time capsule and just woke up today in Long Island and went over to Stony Brook, and then went over to Hofstra, they would be in a state I'd say of shock. No. Well, they, you were there when we be. built the stadium at Hofstra. Wow. Right? We yeah. redid the Margiotta Hall. We mm-hmm. redid the stadium. Well, yeah. you know what happened, Manny? And when I went back that day, they dropped football. Lacrosse had the whole Margiotta Hall. Yeah. They had already moved football out of it into the uh, into the press box, and it was it was disheartening. It wow. was it was terrible. Yeah, and, and the thing is, you, you brought up lacrosse, for instance, okay? I had never, when I came to Long Island, I'd never seen lacrosse. You hear of it, but you just, you know, this, yeah. this wasn't my part of the world. Sure. And, and I remember coming up, and the stadium was, that spring, it was like rocking. It's like, this is loud. What is going on? It's like, we didn't have spring ball or anything. Right, right. And I look in there, and there was this kid, Mark Cox, who was like running around playing lacrosse. Great super back for us. Great player. <laughs> And uh, and I look around and then I'm like, geez, this is it's a really cool sport. It's a great sport. Sure, it was. You yeah. know, and as I found out over the time, remember Duncan Smith? Yeah, sure, you Duncan know, yeah. from Manhasset. Yes. I think he was up there, and he would tell us about the stories of Jim Brown, Jim Brown, and, and playing lacrosse and everything. And and then I think now it's like um, when we were there, John Donowski 
was the lacrosse coach. Mm-hmm. He's now lacrosse coach at Duke. Sure. You know, and he was, we were all in that same office end zone complex <laughs> together. And it was, he was, I mean, John's a great guy. Right. And I, I think we all got along great. And then all of a sudden, 90% of it was football up there because it's just him and maybe an assistant and all that. Right. And now it's. Went the whole different way. Yeah. Well, yeah. remember our, remember our little corner Shanahan? Yeah. Pat Shanahan, sure. his brother played at post, Dave. Mm-hmm. Well, his, his, the youngest, they had like four brothers, the youngest of them, Dougie, came and played for us. He was the best lacrosse. He was the guy. He was our strong safety. Yeah. And he won like the equivalent to the Heisman Trophy in lacrosse the first year they had it. Wow. It's called like the Twingling or Award or something. Yeah. He won that. Wow, and yeah. and he was our strong safety, and he won that award. Yeah, it's amazing. It's just, yeah, it is amazing, and it's sad. I think because so many people right now, as as great of a university as Hofstra is, mm. and uh, it, there's something missing. Yeah, it is. You know, and uh, you don't want to be condescending to places that don't play football, but you know, I forget who it was. If it was Woody Holtz, Woody Hayes, or Lou Holtz, one of those guys said that. When you don't have a football program, it's basically, uh, (laughs) what is it, a glorified study hall, you know? (laughs) But it it is what it is. It's interesting you say that because when I went to Bryant, their president played at the Naval Academy. Yeah. They didn't have football. Oh. So this was five years prior. So he said, he goes, we got to have football. You got to have something for on a fall afternoon to have homecoming and to have, yeah. you know, parents' day and to have mm-hmm. you know some start some rivalries, and he started football mm-hmm. just because of what you're saying. Yeah, and that, it was missing. He said there was something missing. It is, and and, and football there's, it does bring a certain vibrancy to any campus mm-hmm. at, at any level. I mean, high school, college, we know what the pros do, but th- that's. That's why we do what we do. That's right. You know? That's right. And I know we're mentioning a lot of guys, you know, we didn't like Charlie Adams, we didn't mention them, but I mentioned Kamal. We had such good guys that all played together. But it's, and those NFL guys, those are great guys, and we're happy about them all. But, you know, it's the Tyree Allisons mm-hmm. and those guys that we got out of the city who were, came from nothing, and now mm-hmm. they're teachers and businessmen and doing the- great. You know, I had a, I put an old VHS tape on a few years back, and it was Hofstra, us against maybe Fordham or something. And there's George Beisel. George you Beisel. Know, from Philadelphia, you know, great quarterback. Oh. And I think when he was done, he had a bunch of the records there. Right. And, uh, well, the, you know, the game all. Brown, I mean, there was, Ugh. right? Karan Brown, forget about it. Right. The game wow. I'll never forget. Well, I don't know if it was your first game or early. One of the games we go in. Well, the first quarterback breaks his finger. Fuck now. The Tim, second quarterback splits his uh, – George splits his webbing on his finger, on yeah. his hand. He's out. We're down to the third quarterback yeah. in the first quarter. I don't – was that your first year? First game ever. That's what I thought. Yeah. That's what so I we thought. we lose Timmy Lynch, right. George Beisel, and then all of a sudden we've got Michael Dodo. Mike Dodo's in there. Coming in. And freshman. we won. Freshman. We won. Oh, yeah. yeah. Freshman. True freshman. Win the game. And then it took, and, and this is what was fascinating, that we had a rule there, and I don't know if it was my rule or Joe's rule, somehow we said, you know, you don't lose your job to an injury. Right. You know, when you're back, ready to go, you get your job back. So then Dodo starts the next game. Like a couple games. Yeah, yeah. Couple, <laughs> lets somebody up for like, I think he had 500 yards one game. And then, and then George Beisel comes back, and he's playing CW Post, which is now... LIU post. LIU right post, yeah. And he lights them up, and I think he got a 500-yard game himself. I think you're right. I think, right? yeah. And it's it. like four or five games later, and we're playing Fordham. And Timmy Lynch is back. It's seven games into the season. Right. And Timmy Lynch comes back, and um, and, this, and to this day, I'm thinking like I'm magical. It's my first OC job, right? And I'm realizing those guys were magical. Yeah, they were. And, and, and he comes out in that game. He goes 50 of 64 for hmm. 585 yards passing wow. Wow. against Fordham. And it was at the time when that game was over, we're out in the parking lot, 
and our SID, Jim um, Sheehan, Sheehan, right? Jim says that was the longest game in the history of college football at that time. Because we're both throwing it <laughs> throwing a bunch, it, yeah. and then they couldn't. I mean, was Joe Moorhead the head coach, uh, the quarterback at Fordham at that yes, time? Yes, he, he was the quarterback at that time. Yeah. Isn't that something? Yeah. Isn't that something? Yeah. That's that's amazing. It is. So, so you, you know, there, there's so many good things. And the connection you get with those players, even to this day, you know, if it wasn't for Facebook, I wouldn't be hearing from these guys. Right, it's right, sort of neat. right. Um, you also had mentioned what you guys did with uh, every, like, Christmas time. You have, like, a Hofstra reunion. reunion right? yeah. So how does that work? Well, man, well, he he didn't But The year before you got there, we had a receiver named Chris Coziello. Mm-hmm. And... He owns restaurants. Okay. So he no, owns one in Manhattan, a great place. So about, I'm going to say 10 years ago, Carlos Garay yeah. started at Rahway, New Jersey. They, I guess they all got together, just an impromptu thing. And, you know, 25 guys showed up. And they all threw in 50 bucks or whatever they did. So the next year was like, let's invite everybody. Mm-hmm. So now I went, I went last year and it was like... A, 125 guys from all the years, just, you know, a lot of old stories, and, you know, they get exaggerated every year, but it was just a great time yeah. to have all these guys. Oh, yeah, no doubt. I think, so. Yeah, that, that was a great experience, and, uh, you know, it's it just something that, uh, you know, they're There's continuing another legend it. we got in. Yeah, we have just Mike Kelly legends. here. Yep, he'll be on here later. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so... You know, the, the whole experience and, and how it's continuing and, you know, occasionally you hear like, oh, Hofstra should bring back football right. and all that. And, and maybe they will because a lot of programs are getting started all over the country. Right. I mean, it's funny. There's less dropping uh, than there are starting, you know, around, yeah. uh, everywhere. I mean, you look at some of the schools in Florida sure. we had talked about that started football, West Florida. You know, you got other other wonderful campuses. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Florida Gulf Coast, great looking place. Should be playing football. Oh yeah, and, and Hofstra should be playing. Football. No question. Yeah. So as we as they talk about Hofstra in, in the annals, oh, when C- Coach Gardy was there, he used to say, "Our famous alumni, you know, yeah. Francis Ford Coppola, that's right, and Madeline Kahn." Yeah. Well, now they add Wayne Corbett and they add Marcus Colston, and they add mm-hmm. those names of the guys we coached, which yeah. is. And there's like, like I said, there's like six guys that have Super Bowl rings that we coached. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, it's fantastic. But, you know. But that was a great run we had up there. And after that, the end, the end my story is I went to Bryant University after yeah. that. Yeah. And so. it's been something else. And you're still, you know, the thing is, and for our people listening and watching on this is, you know, I think uh, one of the things that always was interesting to me is your background in coaching. You had... Uh, I mean, you've had some legendary guys you learned from. Oh, no question. You, know, you, you think about Bill Arnsparger. Yeah, I worked with him for two years up at Cornell. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I can do a couple name drops, but two, two things that happened along the way with me. I was an assistant at Davidson, and our defense coordinator, who's from West Virginia, so he says, he comes in one day, and it's me, Dave Unger, and, and Cy, Jim Seiple. He says, he goes, well, there's a guy up at Michigan State, the defense coordinator, whose wife is from my hometown. Mm-hmm. This guy's name is Nick Saban. He says, he goes, I'm going to call him and, you know, kind of get into the conversations and see if we can come visit. So me, Cy, and, and Dave Unger, we, we fly up to Michigan State. On a Sunday, I'll never forget this, we fly up on a Saturday night to get the stay over, so it was a cheaper flight. Mm-hmm. And we're going to stay Sunday, Monday, and fly home Tuesday or Wednesday. It didn't matter. So he he called this Nick Saban, and Nick Saban says, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll meet you guys at the office Sunday at 10 o'clock in the morning. He goes, but I'm going to – so he gets there, and he opens the door, and, you know, it's the old 16-millimeter film. And mm-hmm. he says, look, I can't stay here. My wife will kill me if I take a Sunday, a whole Sunday. It's the only day I got off. So I'm gonna, I'll let you set you guys up. You can watch all the film you want. And then tomorrow we're going to have our meetings. You come into the meetings. So that's at 10 o'clock in the morning. 
Lo and behold, it's 2.30. He's still talking to us, right? <laughs> and fi finally, he says, I got to get out of here. Now, they're running the old, I don't know, you, you, you heard of the Stunt 4-3, sure. the Michigan State Stunt 4-3, because George Perlis bought it from the Steelers. So he explains his whole defense to us. For, so he leaves. It's like 3 o'clock, he leaves. He comes back two hours later or whatever, and he goes, my wife's making dinner. You guys come over for dinner. So he has us at his house. So then we stay with him for three days, and we learn the stunt four or three, which was interesting, interesting defense that, you know, they ran, and they were very successful. And then he was, a, he was an influence in that part of it. And then when I went to Hofstra, obviously, Coach Gardy had, hey, here's our defense. Here's what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. We went over and got the Jet playbooks and – here it is. Wow. And then I work with Bill, you know, and then through the years, you know, you pick up a lot of things. And it's, uh, it's, um, I think the people you work with, Manny, they're just great people. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's, that's the thing about it. The kids and the, and the, and the guys you work with, they're influenced on my life, mm -hmm. you know, and influenced on my kids' lives. You know, all my, my, Sarah, my daughter Sarah at the Falcons, you know, all she ever knew was coaches. Yeah. They were like all his uncles. So mm -hmm. Yeah, I used to bring her to the convention. Uh, I'd, I'd see Sarah keep growing yeah. up every year. Uh, wow, she's awesome. Well, and she, she was, yeah, she was director yeah. of football operations from Northeastern at Georgia State. Now she's with the Falcons. So. Yeah. She's yeah. doing well. Well, yeah, she certainly gets it. And maybe I have to have her on this podcast. Yeah, well. you should. You That'll should. <laughs> I love it. But no, that's, that's fantastic. And Greg, you know, I, I think – uh, without question, you know, I've always uh, respected what you've done on defense. You made my life really easy <laughs> running an offense years ago. I got way too much credit for it, and uh, but that's, I think, part of the offense. You know, just, well, you know, offensive guys get all this glory, and the defensive guys are really doing all the work. And um, But it is what it is. Yeah. And, uh, but you've had a fantastic career. Yeah, it's not over. You. No. You, you got a lot more still coming down the pike. And I think what's really awesome to me is when you think about the coaching profession, you get, it, it, there's such a dichotomy. You get these really young guys, you know, that, mm -hmm. that, are, that some of them are fantastic, like Lincoln Riley, and, sure. you know, you get these guys that get it, and then, and some of them bomb, but it happens. Right. You know? And then you've got these, when you look at the highest levels in the National Football League, the top places, mm -hmm. you've got these guys that I always consider master coaches. These master coaches are guys like yourself mm -hmm. that, that have, that just know, they can literally shut your eyes and hear a guy make a tackle and know it's the right, the right way to do it. Yeah. You just know. And it's an experience. I, I think the Rams have the, you yeah. know, the young head coach and the old defense coordinator. Oh, yeah. Right? He's exactly. twice as old as the head coach. Sure he is. But and he wouldn't, you know, the head coach should. And, it, yeah, I, I get it. You know, he gets, McVay gets a lot of credit. But that defense is why you it's, get to do what you do. Yeah, and it's, you know, when you do it for so many years, man, I was D.C. for 28 years in college. I coached 40 years. And, you know, when it's your stuff, and just like you, when something goes wrong, you know exactly what it was. Mm -hmm. You don't even have to see it again on the film. You, yeah. you say, oh, here's what they did. Here's what happened. He did on this. He bit on that. Or, you know, for you would be a protection broke yeah. down or somebody yeah. missed the block. You know, you just see it fast. Yeah. You really do, yeah. and you know, and and I think even the, the guys, the young guys that I've seen that are fantastic, are the ones that are humble, and they understand it is a process to mm -hmm. get to mastery, and that's the best guys I've seen. So those guys are out there, and you're young. Uh, we know a lot of young coaches are listening and watching this. It's like that's what it's about. Take it's a process. It's not about the grind and all that kind of stuff. It's just getting, making progress, learning from masters, which you have. Mm -hmm. And um, I think all in all, it, it makes our profession great. Yeah. And the, yeah, I think I think the thing about you got to know, like if something this goes wrong, you got to go. What, what are we going to do next? That's right. And that's the thing the experience gives you. Mm -hmm. You know, well, I've seen that before. We got to go do this. That's right. You know, yeah. so somebody's somebody's scheming you up. <laughs> they They're scheming do. you up. Oh yeah, no doubt. That's fantastic. So let's let's plan uh, next or uh, in December. Uh, let me know when the Hofstra reunion is. I, I will. I need to come to New York City and check that. Yeah, you're one gonna out. come fun. out here recruiting. We'll get you on that. Yeah, that'd be great. So, yeah, thanks again, Greg. I, I appreciate, appreciate it. it. Yeah, yeah Manny, thanks for fun. having me and. Uh, 
Good luck this season. We'll yeah, be rooting for you. Fun. Well, that was an awesome interview with Greg Gigantino and um, one of the finest defensive coordinators I've been uh, fortunate enough to work with. And uh, now it's time to segue into our inside access feature, which um, I basically give you some tips and reminders uh, as, as coaches understand that terminology. And what I want to share with you is a story uh, a few years back when I was uh, coaching at Bethany College uh, NAIA school in Lindsburg, Kansas. And that's where I first learned about this next um, product and how it affected me. It was, it was interesting. You know, my wife, uh, Elizabeth, uh, Lizzie is a, um, had been at the time into physical therapy. She was a PTA and she had worked in the industry and so forth. And we had just had our son, Eli, and she decided to stay home. And, and when she was home, uh, she was doing an internship and studying with um, an essential oil company, doTERRA. And, you know, it sort of played into what she did and it was just something to work on and gave us an opportunity because from that point on, she um, never went back to that kind of work again. She just got full time into uh, working as a wellness advocate in doTERRA. Now, the story is as such. My staff and I were heading down to see a good friend of mine, Bob Stoops, at, uh, in Norman and the rest of his staff down at, at, at the University of Oklahoma. And they literally... That morning, I um, our house had two stories to it. I'm I'm carrying our son down the steps, and I trip, and fortunately, I saved him. You know, but my ankle, like just my left ankle just literally blew up. It was just like, it just got inflamed. I, I tripped carrying him. It was early in the morning while this, I'm like, Oh, this is great. This thing's starting to become like a grapefruit and all this. I'm like, Oh man, our whole staff was getting ready to head down to Norman. Uh, we were going to talk ball and do all these things. And I'm like, what am I going to do? So I, I asked Lizzie, I said, I don't know that I can make the trip right now because it's going to be uncomfortable driving about a little over two hours. Um, down to Norman. And she goes, here, let's do this. All right. So she gets this oil and, and it's called uh, deep blue. All right. This is what it looks like right here. Okay. And she gives it to me and says, look, this has been being used by NFL teams, by doctors all over the place as a, and, and all types of wellness physicians and so forth. It's replacing uh, biofreeze, which you see a lot of times in offices. And it's very powerful. And she says, what you do is just take some a few drops of this oil. Let's put it on your ankle, which at this point, like I said, was ballooning up. And then after you put the oil on, uh, we'll put some of this rub on, which is like, uh, think of it, you know, it's a lotion you know, that has this in it. And then we just wrapped it up and put some heat on it, which I'm thinking it just happened. Should I put ice or heat? She goes, no, you put the heat on there because then it drives all of these very powerful um, certified therapeutic grade essential oils into your, um, right into the ankle, into the muscles and everything like that. So we put it on, wrap it up, it's warm it up, and then it starts to feel better. Like I'm talking within a half an hour, it started to feel better. So we did one more application. I said, I'm going to try to make it. So I get in the car and I drive down. And literally, and this is no kidding, over two hours, it just dropped to regular size. I'm like, this is crazy. So I just kept applying this oil uh, the whole time I'm down there. And smelled good, was easy to go through this, and I was able to move around just fine all weekend and uh, see some good friends down there, and um, it worked out great. That was, for me, miraculous. So I said, hey, I'm hooked. I mean, so for me, it's like I've got to make sure it works, uh, you know, before I, you know, and, and telling people about something like this. So I come back, I talk to my athletic trainer, I do a little research on it. And he goes, yeah, this stuff is really good. Let's use this with our players. So I have over the years from Bethany College, uh, our trainer there. And then when I went to Widener, 
um, our trainer there, and and now here at Defiance College, every trainer I've had from that point on uses this and a whole bunch of other ones in their in the training room. And um, in fact, what was interesting is that BYU Steve Pincock, the athletic trainer there, has been using these for th- these products for years. So Deep Blue, powerful. I can remember, you know, players where I would the initial prognosis was, hey, he's out. He he pulled a hamstring and he's out for three or four weeks till we can get him back to full speed. And it was three or four days when they put therapy on this. And we got a guy back the next week, my very best one of my best receivers at Bethany College. Uh, he he yanked it and they said he's trainer says, I don't know what we're gonna do. So we went with this product. So I mean, look. I'm not a doctor, um, but um, I'll tell you this. This product is fantastic. It works. And if you're interested in it, uh, just take a look. Uh, there'll be a link here on uh, my website uh, that, that'll give you a little bit more information on it. Deep Blue is fantastic. And so like at our place, we, uh, we buy the oil and we have it in the training room. A lot of times our players will get this and keep this for themselves. Our players also like this Deep Blue rub in a, in a tube you know, that, that basically has four ounces and lasts pretty much the whole season or so. And then in our locker room and training room, we put this industrial size one right there with the big pump on it. And we just keep it there so all the whole team can use this as they wish. So this gives us a good opportunity to get our guys back. If you get sore from working out, it's really good about that. And um, I'll have more information on the website for you as well. So feel free to go to MannyMattSackis.com and um, and check that out. Uh, I want to thank you for coming on this episode and listening to this podcast. It's been fantastic for us. Um, when you're um, watching this on YouTube, click subscribe up in the top corner. That'd be fantastic to get us uh, so you get alerted to that. But the best deal is to go into MannyMattSackis.com. You will be able to sign up there and you will receive my free report, Fill the Stadium. And uh, it's, uh, it's a report I put together. It's uh, 30-some pages talking about what it will take, what you can do, what I have learned through the years, what you can do to create raving fans and put pack your stadium um, in the fall on the weekend. But I think that, that you'll get that free report when you sign up. Uh, and that's for a limited time only. So if you don't see it on there, it's a little late. But um, we're going to put that out there for you on the front end. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs>